Oops. It is recording already. Oh, it's already recording? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, that's how we start this off with awkward moments. So here we are. Uh, we're on the Blind Man in Black. This is the first episode. And I'm honored to have um, uh, deprofessionalized intellectual author, activist, uh, advisor to the Zapatistas, uh, my dear friend and mentor, Gustavo Esteva. Um, thank you so much. It is a profound honor to have you here because um, you have had a profound impact on my life. And um, we met about, about eight years ago at the SIT Graduate Institute. And um, I remember going into your class <laughs> for the first time and I remember just, you didn't say anything. And everybody was like, all right, what's going on here? Are you, are you, gonna, are you gonna teach us? And, and I just remember it was, it was really brilliant because you were asking us essentially to uh, teach ourselves, learn from each other and not expect um, information disseminated from a higher power. And you really showed um, a, a real uh, form of democratic learning. And I thought it was a, a beautiful and I know that shortly after that we connected, we started talking when you were visiting the campus um, in Vermont. And, uh, you know, our, I think our friendship just kind of uh, exploded. And um, I just, you know, I decided that I wanted to learn more from you and to deepen our friendship. And so um, then we, I, I went and lived in Mexico for nine months and it was, a, it was an amazing experience to, um, you know, just, just see how, uh, you know, this friendship began, you know, our age difference is substantial, yet we, we, we found, found this bond connected through um, shared ideals. And, you know, you really helped to awaken me um, to this, um, what George Carlin calls, uh, <laughs> what he says, he says, it's called the American dream, because you have to be asleep to believe it. And, um, you know, I was asleep for a long time and uh, about 10 years before I met you, I started to wake up and, and I think you helped me, you know, make that transition from not only waking up, but taking action. And I'm deeply grateful. So, um, it was yeah. really beautiful. It was really beautiful, Brian. Uh, you, you, you remember, I was still visiting dirty places like SIT. And uh, and but it's still trying to do something different, not the usual. I I I, I refused to really teach a class uh, forty years ago, uh, and then I was forced to sit there for supposedly a class, but doing my thing that I am not teaching classes anymore. But as you remember very well, not everyone took this uh, <laughs> with in a in a very in a gentle way. Uh, so no, no, no. There, there were, there were um, uh, students that were very upset. They're like, well, we're paying for this, you know? And I, I remember, you know, I could see better uh, then. And I just remember looking at, 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 you know, faces that were upset. They're like, well, I'm paying for this. Why aren't you, why aren't you downloading information into me? And, and uh, it, ironically, the class was called uh, Education and Social Justice, if I remember correctly. And um, that's what I think it was. It was an education in social justice about true democratic leadership and uh, consensus. And um, I mean, I, I got it immediately, and I was I was uh, I was grateful for it because I hadn't experienced it at any point in my learning. You know, growing up from uh, from kindergarten through high school, and I started to get a little bit of that in, in college and in graduate school. But this was the first time where um, an educator had said to me learn from each other rather than you know being the gateway to knowledge and and i really appreciated that and um you and know it was beautiful when you approached me uh, outside the, the the class and we started to talk in two minutes you were no longer a student and i was no longer a teacher and then we started to really talk, uh, to, to, to have a real conversation. That was beautiful. I, I, I really enjoyed it very much. And I, I can uh, remember, I, I can even remember the image, Brian, where we were in that first conversation. 
I have it in my mind. It, it was very beautiful. Yeah, it, I think I think you know I think where it really started and 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 it was kind of like it reminds me you know um, we had that conversation and I think we started from a very vulnerable place because I. I was going through a point where um, a few years earlier I'd stopped driving. I'd chosen to stop driving because I didn't want to injure anybody while um, losing my eyesight. And um, I was in a place, you know, I w wasn't using a cane yet, but I was not able, I was, you know, dealing with the loss of my eyesight. And so I told you about that. And I think, I think through that, you know, I think we formed a, you know, connection and, and, uh, and I'm just grateful. And, you know, um, I think I, I kind of like to start, uh, you know, because I think about a lot about how I became the person that I am today and the experiences that formed me. And I, I want to get a sense and I want the listeners and viewers to get a sense of, of, of how you became the person that you are today. Like what were some of the, the, um, the, the, the foundational moments uh, or the formative moments that uh, form the person that you are today. Could you talk a little bit about your early experiences? I, I think one, one of the things it is a foundation that is in a very real sense, the opposite of who I am today. Um, you know the story, uh, my grandmother could not enter into my house uh, in Mexico City through the front door because she was an Indian, she was a Zapotec. And my mother, like many other people of her generation, assumed that the best thing that she could do for her children was to radically uproot us from our connect any connection with our indigenous ancestry. And that means that uh, those first memories of my childhood incl includes accepting as the normal a very racist and patriarchal situation. I was not seeing, the word racism was absolutely outside my, my picture. I, I was not seeing myself as part of the plot to protect my grandmother for not, not being seen by my, my father. That was normal, uh, that was acceptable. And, uh, and then when a little later, I was 13 years old, uh, President Truman, um, shaped us as underdeveloped uh, and uh, we accepted this idea of being underdeveloped and, and you know we have discussed this that um, if you accept that you are underdeveloped this is really very humiliating you, you can no longer trust your noses you need to trust the noses of the experts you, you can no longer dream your dreams because they already dreamt you want to be like them uh, I have excuse. I always use this excuse. It was the 40s. It was the movies, was the new entertainment. We were running every weekend to see the last movie. And Hollywood was presenting uh, the American way of life as the thing closest to paradise. And then when President Truman told us, you can have all this, we will share with you all our scientific and technological advances, and you can have all this. Of course, we wanted that. And I wanted that for my grandmother. Uh, it was very clear. Uh, I wanted development for her, for my nation, for everyone. And that is how I was shaped in the first part of my, of my, of my life. That was the construction. You know, I, I think about that. You know, when, you, when you're talking about that's, you know, the, you, at that time growing up, you, you didn't know uh, another way. It was like, that's, it reminds me of that Bukowski uh, poem. Uh, uh, I think it's called Dinosauria We. And, and the first line is born into this. And then he lists off, you know, all these things that we were born into. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a strange thing. You know, it's kind of like as cliche as it is, it's like the matrix, you know, you, you're, <laughs> you were born into this this uh, thing that's been constructed for you, and uh, it's every every aspect of our society, from um, parenting to uh, schooling to uh, businesses and and so on. There, everything is geared and marketed towards seeing 
this uh, American um, culture as the ideal for the perfect, you, you know, society. Um, and uh, as we know, it's a lie. But, you know, I, the thing is, that what I'm interested in is I really want to know what, where is that moment where you saw the lie for what it was and, and then said, hey, I, I, I want to change this. I want, I want a better life that, you know, what I wanted for my grandmother originally wasn't, was, you know. Yeah. It was very clear and, and I, I uh, get, got the lesson. Uh, from the the from American corporations, no other but American corporations. Uh, almost by accident, I started with a new profession uh, that, with the support of Harvard Business School, and the market was waiting for us. And then it was I was immediate success. Um, they told me that with my new profession, I would be at the center of the epic of development. I will be producing good services to the community, good uh, conditions for the workers, good profits for the stakeholders. And we would be cooking the cake and, and organizing the distribution of the cake. And then I entered the market and then I was 19 years old when I became personal manager on Procter & Gamble in Mexico. Then a year later, uh, I was in IBM also as uh, personal manager on, of, of IBM. Um, and then I put my own professional bureau with great success, money, prestige, etc. And very, very young. But at the same time, I saw what was happening there. I was fired from, from Procter & Gamble. I was fired from IBM because I refused to do what they asked me to do. That was to cheat the workers and the community and to cheat in a very ugly way. That was the normal kind of things. That was normal for a personal manager to do. Uh, this was the time, I must say this. It was the time for us in Latin America. It was the same time of Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. It was the victory of the Cuban revolution and the the image of the Che really, really became a model for us. And at the same time in Mexico, we had the greatest mobilizations of the century. And the city was occupied by the workers. And then we have all the strikes that the, the country paralyzed because of the strikes of the biggest unions of Mexico. Then it was the combination of things happening in the, in the real world, in the streets, in, the, in, the, 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 in Latin America, and things happening in my personal life, my education by the corporation, what is really the American dream? What is the meaning of the American dream? And then because of this combination of the two, these two factors, being fired from IBM, being fired from Procter & Gamble, and not because I was doing something wrong, because I refused to do something wrong, I was fired. Um, and then because of this combination, this forced me to become a leftist and then become, um, after some time of being a leftist, I became a Marxist. And then after being a Marxist, this was the time of Che Guevara. And then I was um, part of a clandestine group with the aspiration to become a guerrilla. That, that was the, the whole process. Let's stop for a second because I, I I mentioned this and I really I really want to get to this you know like this fundamental um, you know and I'm fascinated by the idea of of the the, the choices we have in life and and the things we do um, you know I have a friend who's um, who went to uh, West Point as uh, went to Iraq. Um, is a veteran, um, and uh, he's now the peace leadership director of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. You know, he grew up in a very, very violent childhood, and um, you know, uh, his father had uh, PTSD from uh, both the Korean and Vietnam Wars, and he, he, you know, he, uh, he, his, he projected his trauma outwards onto my friend uh, as a child fit with physical violence, and. You know, my friend, he could said, he said he could have become, you know, uh, the monster that, you know, that he was fearing. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he, he could easily have been a, you know, like a mass shooter. And, the, you know, I asked him, what's, where, where, 
where did that moment come where you decided I'm going to go in this direction and, 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 and wage peace. Um, and I, I want to find that with you. I want to know what was that moment? Was it, if it's not a moment, what are the series of moments that, that changed you to go in a direction of leftist, leftist being Marxist and, uh, and so on? What, what was that? It, could it have been, and I, I'm going to put this out here just because I want to explore it. But, you know, I think about my own grandmother and, and the love she had for me. And I'm thinking that there is a parallel there with your grandmother as well, that there was something there that was different from what you experienced from your father, which, you know, that, that, uh, you know, patri patriarchy and, and that, uh, racism that he was, uh, you know, trained in. So can you, can you talk a little bit about that, that, that moment, if, if there was one? I think the question, because during, when I was a child, I succeeded in, I adored my grandmother and I was uh, sent for holidays with her twice uh, during my childhood. And I learned a few things with her, but that it was many years later that I recovered that kind of memories. That, that those were hidden in the back of my mind. They, they, they was uh, buried <laughs> because I was basically trained for development, for all kind of things. And really my dream was of course being a, 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 a personal manager was an immediate success. If I was just 20 years old, I was already uh, in the top management of a big company. Uh, that was success and that was a part, that was the dream of my, uh, when I was a teenager. That was great, that was, I was fulfilling my dream. But my dream was to be in that position to do the right kind of things. And then when in IBM, um, as personal manager, I was responsible for the training of the sales force. The salesmen were the more important people for IBM. They were selling IBM in Mexico. They were selling the first computers in Mexico. Uh, and then I was the person responsible of giving them the proper training as IBM people, to transform them in IBM people as I was trying to transform people in Procter, in Procter men. Um, and then in IBM, they explained it to me something that uh, many people discovered many years later. The first computers will not reduce the number of people. They in fact represented an increase in the number of people that was not really saving uh, um, labor. But uh, I uh, was instructed to train the salesmen in cheating, not to tell this to the companies, to sell the computers with the idea that the computer will finally reduce the number of people, reduce labor. What we now know very well, that the automation that implies putting people out for the machines will do the things. But at the beginning, the computers did not imply that. And then IBM told me, my bosses told me, you need to shape the salesmen in a certain way for them to cheat without knowing they are cheating. <laughs> that, that, that. <laughs> because yeah, 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 yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I, I'm... <laughs> I met somebody relatively recently that was a, a an executive for I think um, Intel, and I was kind of trying to uh, bring up the idea of, of built-in obsolescence, which we know is 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 very pervasive in every a aspect of production. And uh, I said, you know, it, it just you know, it, I was trying to say, isn't it a little out of control the built-in obsolescence? You buy a computer, and then within three to five years, it's you know either uh, the software doesn't support the uh, hardware or whatever they say it is, and um, and he was like, "Oh no, that's just oh, that's just how uh, technology is, you know. It just it, it, everything gets updated." And and I was like, ah, "That's that's a bunch of fucking bullshit." And I was just like, "All right, all right." I didn't go into it with him because I I could see that he was well indoctrinated, but um, I think that's exactly what they know how to do is is to find a way to. Uh, 
get the employees to believe the lie and exactly. perpetuate it. A salesman should be a, a person absolutely convinced that he is selling the best thing in the world. And then he must not know that he's cheating. Mm -hmm. And then you, you can imagine, I, I was in the night thinking, oh God, this is not possible. They, they, this, this cannot be true. Why they are asking me this, this uh, whole thing? And then I immediately, I was immediately feeling my friends, my companies, Mexican companies, companies will buy these stupid things, thinking something, but they are buying something else. Mm -hmm. And, and then I, it was a revelation. It was then I, I I refused to do that kind of things. And then, of course, the people in IBM saying, "Well, this is not the guy to be personal manager." Mm -hmm. <laughs> then they fired me. And again, um, in Procter Gamble, um, in Mexico, you have very good laws to protect the people in case you fire them. You need to pay them a very solid um, final payment and indemnization. Then um, Procter & Gamble have hundreds of people hired for promotion as the people are going from uh, in the shops selling the products of Procter & Gamble. And uh, for this promotion, they hired them for only 28 days because after 29 days, you become a permanent worker. And then after 28 days, they uh, have one day off and then they hire them again for other 28 days. And then we had personnel for 20 years working in that way without accumulation of rights of these 20 years. And then the policies of Procter changed and then they decided uh, that they will no longer have this kind of personnel. And they asked me to put in the street um, 300 people without any payment. People that worked with a lot of loyalty for Procter & Gamble for many, many years. Then I was the one uh, that uh, was uh, instructed to put them out of work, not to hire them again without any payment. I could not do that. But the question is like, what, what I'm trying to get at is like, what, who taught you how to love and be compassionate? And how, how did you, because you could have easily said or found a way, which I think a lot of people do is justify uh, the horrors they, they inflict upon people. And, um, you know, the, the famous thing, there's a, <laughs> there's a movie called Taken with Liam Neeson. It's about human trafficking and he plays a CIA agent. And um, his daughter is is taken, and um, for human trafficking, and he basically you know follows the the trail of um, you know the hierarchy of the the criminal organization, and he gets to the top, and you know it's a guy in a tuxedo, and he's and he's like I have a family. This is only business. Can't you see this is this is only business? And I think a lot of people, um, you know, it, all over, you know, that are indoctrinated you know, through, through the ideals of capitalism that, you know, you can commit any crime or atrocity in the name of business. My question to you is like, how did you, how did you have that foundation to, to be able to say, you know, yeah, basta, enough is enough and, and say, I don't, I don't want to do this, you know? I mean, I think what I'm also kind of hearing is in one sense is that, you know, you went in to do good things and then you realize once you got there that it was a lie you know, it reminds me, there's a great movie, um, not a movie, it's a TV series that was canceled. It was called The Brink and it was about, um, you know, politics. And um, Tim Robbins played the Secretary of State of the United States. And he's, he says, uh, this, he's talking to his wife or somebody, I can't remember who it was, but he says, um, you know, people get into politics to change things from the inside. But once they get in, the inside changes them. What... What was the, what, go ahead. In a real sense, it was innocence and stupidity, uh, um, Brian, uh, because the point was that I believed them 
uh, I was trained with the series of illusions in the same way that I believed Truman, I believed the goods of development, I believed that they were bringing to us the great blessing of, uh, of uh, following that, that path, and I believed that. I believed that for many years. It was a very, very terrible lesson to, to wake up seeing the horror of development. Well, in the same sense, uh, that new profession was in a Jesuit university. And they taught me all, the, all the, my training was for the good. We were doing the good. We were trained to, to do something good for the workers, good for everyone. Our profession was something I was shaped to do something very good. And I believed them. It was pure innocence. I accepted what they were telling me. Yes, we are here to do something good, to bring the goods to everyone. Uh, and then that was, that created, they gave me a sense of justice. Yes, what is fair, what is not fair, that you must not cheat. They gave me that and I believed them. It was pure innocence. It was my, my real stupidity. Then I was seeing the claims of the workers in the streets. You were Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, etc., in the outside. And then in my personal life, um, I, when I was instructed by Procter Gamble to do something against the workers, I was immediately, my heart was with the workers, not with the company. And then what I did, that was the horror for Procter, um, I gave the workers all the information and uh, as gave them the tools for them to resist and get their indemnization, how they can proceed legally against the company and get their payment. Uh, that was horrible for Procter & Gamble. That represented a lot of money for, 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 for them. Uh, but that was, in a sense, uh, following my lessons. I was taught about justice. I was explaining that we were doing something for social justice. And then I applied that lessons that was clearly in contradiction with the real world. It was a revelation of that the real world is not what they taught, taught me to that it was. I think a lot of people, you know, uh, it, when you were talking, it reminded me of this article I read about um, someone that was in the U.S. military. And, you know, he said as a child, he watched Star Wars and, you know, he, he wanted to be Luke Skywalker and fight against the Empire. And he thought by joining the army, he could become like Luke Skywalker, that hero. And then when he went to war and saw what was really happening, he said, I'm, I'm not Luke Skywalker. I'm just one of the stormtroopers of the Galactic Empire. And I think a lot of people have that awakening yeah. that, you know, it's all the propaganda machine that we have is is a lie and it, and it reminds me and actually this i'm going to bring this up because it was in the um you showed it remember the story of stuff the uh the, the video that you showed us in class um and in that the the uh person that was presenting was talking about um the marketing advertising executive victor lebeau and uh, one of the things he said, and I'm, I'm just paraphrasing because I don't remember it exactly, but he basically says, we need to make consumption ritualized, that it becomes like a religion and that, you know, we have to manufacture things so that they can be used up, burned up and thrown away as quickly as possible so that people can keep buying new products. But we have to instill the sense of ritualized consumption. And I think, you know, a lot of people are, are, it's a hard thing. I mean, I know I went through it. I mean, it took me, you know, from birth until 30, really. I mean, I think I started to get a sense, and I don't want to say this because it's really uh, an instrumental part of my life. I remember uh, watching George Carlin talk about, uh, it was, I think it was Jammin' in New York was the special, but he talks about the war industry and and he talks about all these things. I remember him exposing the lie through humor so brilliantly. And I, I remember I always had that in the back of my mind, but I still couldn't break free from the programming 
you know, through schooling and everything and, and parenting and it, you know, I, 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 it, that programming was always there, but underneath that, I felt the revolution, you know, and I think George Carlin really opened that up for me when I was in the early nineties. Um, Here, there is a difference, I think, for you Americans and, and uh, I as a Mexican, that we were raised in a different way. Because I, my feeling is that you are raised from very, very beginning in the idea that profit is something good. And uh, if you are doing something with the logic of profit and the profit for you, selflessness is something good, the right thing to do is to get a profit every moment and every condition in which you are, uh, you are shaped that way to live for profit. Uh, and for a specific benefit for you. And we are not raised that way. Uh, that, 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 that is not how I was shaped, how the Mexicans are shaped. We bought the idea of development. We bought the idea of uh, living, having the American way of life, of transporting the American way of life to Mexico. That we bought the idea. But we were not shaped inside us with the logic of profit that you need to use every opportunity to get the benefit. And then it is okay if, if you get a profit, if that guy teaching that, uh, that kind of lesson, it's for the profit of the company and then the profit of all the employees, that is good. That is absolutely acceptable. Yes, you, you are doing something terrible to the people, but that is okay if, it is, if you are getting the profit. The profit motive is really in your bones, in your blood. You, you are educated to look for the for profit. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I, I would say that's very true. Um, you know, I, I, I was thinking about how there's a film, since you mentioned, you know, uh, the film industry, uh, there's a film called Wall Street. And I, think was, I can't remember, it was like 1986 or seven when it was came out. And it had uh, Michael Douglas's Gordon Gecko, you know, Wall Street executive. And, uh, you know, he, he said in the film, greed is good. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, people, I mean, I think some people watched that movie and saw that it was trying to show the uh, destructiveness of that pathological desire for uh, wealth and power. Um, but I think others saw that film and were like, yeah, I like this. I'm, 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 I, I think this, this speaks to me. You know what I mean? It really um, is really good. And you can see and you can argue. You can have an argument. And they can explain to you why greed is good and, and how, it's, how you can create um, happiness for everyone through greed. But, but let's, I, I want to know, I really want to know who... Who are the people that developed your idea of love? And, um, and I, want to, I want it to kind of lead into your, you know, uh, your long-time relationship with your current partner. But where did it begin? What, where did you receive your, your, your kind of paradigm for how to love? Um, part of it, uh, I must say, I think... It is because of the lack of love. Uh, because I was almost uh, a kind of ghost in my house. Uh, I was invisible. Uh, I was uh, looking for love all the time, trying to do something to get love. And then not being loved was perhaps uh, the, the, the main uh, way of shaping the, the need for love, the lack of love. Uh, just to give you an example, um, for the birthday of, birthday of every member of my family, since I was three or four years old, uh, I was uh, organizing something uh, to celebrate that birthday and to prepare gifts for, for the person in secret um, to celebrate the person the day of the birthday. Uh, and then the day of the birthday, I, at the very beginning, I was singing for the person, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then the day of my birthday, I can remember this very, very well. Usually at 10 o'clock in the evening, I was telling my family, 
well, you know, today was my birthday and nobody cared. It is just a story, a very important story for me because that's, this was many years, not once, several years happened. That illustrates the point. To get love, I was trying to look at of a lot of expressions of love for the other people, but to get a piece of love. Um, and then I was uh, educated not in love through love, but the opposite, through the lack of love, looking for love, trying to do something to get attention, to get some kind of, of, of love. And that was uh, many, many, many years of my life. Um, and then, um, yes, when I, I found the, the love of my partner, uh, that was clearly forever. Uh, we have been together, well, this is ridiculous, but I can't remember that I saw her for the first time in December 14, 1965. <laughs> and I can't remember that afternoon, the, the image of her, uh, it is clearly, it, it was discovering love, real love. Uh, and there, yes, we have been together more than 50 years. And our relation today is really very, very alive and, and, and full of, of many daily expressions of love after 50, 50 years. We can even laugh for what we are doing to each, for each other every day in, in, in our daily life. Um, that is really discovery because of, of the need I have of real love. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm fascinated by the fact that some people who are, you know, experience um, traumas or uh, are, you know, neglected in, in the sense that you're talking about, um, how people um, either they seek a path of, of becoming more loving and empathetic, or they start externalizing their trauma and anger in, in both verbally and uh, physical, physical violence. And I'm, I'm fascinated by, you know, you could have gone either way, you know, you could have, you could have, when you were Procter and Gamble, you could have said, yeah, I'm, I, I want this. I want to, I want more money. I want more power, you know? And uh, it's, it's amazing to me, you know, the paths we take. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, how you met your partner? And, and uh, Well, I, I met her in the, that kind of clandestine group um, that we were trying to organize the revolution. We had the obligation, the moral imperative of organizing the revolution following Che Guevara. And then we were the, those in that clandestinity. And that is just also a peculiar condition of, of, of love, of intimacy. It's uh, the complicity you, you, you need. You are with your, 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 uh, the other members of your group uh, really are in a very special situation that creates very strong bonds. That that group it's a, it's a very expression of of a one form peculiar form of of love because of the complicity in you are organizing the revolution and the revolution it's not for you it's not for the be, to be the leader you are really trying to produce a radical social change for the benefit of the people and then you are you are an accomplice in that you are in secret you are having all kind of of uh, elements. To, to organize the things uh, in a very special way, to organize the revolution. That was also a very important lesson in love and how to love each other. And that was the context in which I saw her for the first time. And we were together first in that kind of activity and then in the tragic end of that group, that, that, that was a horrible way. We ended in a very, very bad way. And then we, we were together in learning the lessons and how we changed our path and how we took the decision, many of us, to abandon violence. Uh, that was, again, another way of innocence. Uh, after our clandestine group uh, failed, exploded in a very horrible way, 
then and we decided to abandon the path of violence the idea of the guerrilla is to seize power that is the whole point we will capture uh, the state the power of the government to organize the revolution and then when we abandoned the path of violence we said okay let's join the government and then conquer uh, the power from inside uh, and I was clearly obsessed with that in that in the 70s I was already we had a populist president and uh, suddenly I got an immense amount of power I was in cabinet meetings I was uh, at the top of the government um, getting the power we wanted and organizing development programs massively with millions of people for the benefit of the people uh, it was with such success in that process uh, that by the end of that administration I was in the immediate danger of becoming a minister in the new administration but by that time I knew what was it that the government was not the place we wanted for social change that it was a paratus a dispositive for control and domination and for manipulation of the people, not for social change. And then I, I, I quit, I, I, I abandoned. Um, in 1976, I abandoned any relation with the government because we knew very well what was it. And then that was breaking with all my previous beliefs. Since I was in the supposed, uh, the clandestine group to become a guerrilla and to seize power, I, all this training, Marxist training, uh, to seize power and to organize the social revolution with the control on the state from the state, that was the break in the 70s. I, I was forced to abandon that new religion of, uh, of um, in a very real sense, the, the Marxist religion. Um, it was beautiful. I, I can say in, in the 70s when this happened, I abandoned it, uh, I broke with the Marxist religion, and then I reclaimed Marx. <laughs> I started to see in Marx a great thinker uh, with very important uh, lessons to learn from him, but no longer the religion of seizing power to organize the revolution, etc., etc. the whole story of Soviet Union and Cuba, etc. I mean, um... So how did you, I mean, uh, you were prepared to, you know, go into armed conflict and how did you make that transition to saying uh, violence may not be the path that we want to take? What, 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 how did that change? Well, uh, to, to be ready to use violence and to use, uh, to kill in cold blood, that is necessary if you need, if you, if you require the training for a guerrilla, you need to be ready to kill in cold blood. For example, an ambush for the army. And then you, you, you need to kill a guy that did nothing to you. And perhaps he's the son of a campesino. Uh, that is not easy. Uh, you, are, you are not trained, you are, you are not naturally uh, prepared for violence, for this kind of violence. And then we were being trained. To, to know how to use, a to use a weapon is very easy. You learn it in the morning. But to, to have this kind of violence inside you, to be ready to use the violence, you need training. And then we were training ourselves day after day in this kind of violence, fighting against our feelings, our hearts, trying to shape ourselves in a certain way. And then we suffer the consequence. Uh, one of our leaders killed the other leader for a woman uh, and then uh, that we saw what happens with that violence now that violence can become entirely irrational and can control you instead of you controlling the violence you are not using the violence for your purpose but the violence is controlling you and then that that was the the lesson we we learned that we cannot follow that that path that can take control of you and bring you to, to, to all kinds of horrors. Uh, that, that, was, that was the lesson. That was how it ended, uh, that movement ended in the worst possible way. Now, 
when did you encounter Gandhi and, and uh, where did that happen? Did that, was that around the same time when you started studying nonviolence? Around the time studying nonviolence, non we were trying to follow an alternative path without abandoning the, the social ideals, without abandoning the idea of the revolution, uh, trying to explore different ways. And yes, of course, we I started to read Gandhi and to follow, the, to study, to consider different options uh, for the struggle. Um, in Mexico, that is a very long story that perhaps it's not so interesting. In Mexico, we could not really consider the possibility of the Gandhian style of the style uh, outside the system. You played with the system or you played with the guerrilla. That was no, no intermediary options. And then uh, that was why we joined the system to a struggle against the system from inside. Um, that was something peculiar in Mexico, but with the ideas of Gandhi and, and Gandhian ideas that was very, very clear for us that were, we adopted those ideas very deeply. And particularly when we were out of the government and uh, trying to follow an independent path with the people themselves at the grassroots since 1976. Then that was very clear, a Gandhian path. Uh, and then we were trying to have that kind of organization and that kind of struggle. Um, I, I, I was absolutely convinced of this nonviolent way. Um, that uh, was, uh, was interesting how, how strong uh, it was. Um, I think I, I share with you uh, one, another crisis years later. In 1994, we have the Zapatista uprising and we were really uh, with uh, in, millions of us were in the streets with the Zapatistas telling them you are not alone. Um, and also telling them um, we don't want more violence. Uh, but at the same time, I was telling myself, Gustavo, what is happening to you? You have been for 30 years in the Gandhian path of nonviolence. And suddenly you are celebrating uh, in the street an army and they are killing each other. And they are doing exactly the kind of things that you abandoned 30 years ago. Uh, why you are betraying, betraying yourself? in celebrating the Zapatistas. And um, I rushed again to my Gandhi uh, to try to explain myself why, why I was doing what I was doing. Um, and then I read a story, a well-known story. Uh, Gandhi suffered an attempt and then his son asks him, what should I do if someone comes here and try to kill you or try to hurt you? Should I preach nonviolence? And then Gandhi smiles and said, no, you must not be a coward. And you can use, you must use violence if you are the weak. If I am preaching nonviolence to the people in India, it's because I don't see why 300 million people are afraid of 150,000 British, because they are the strong, they should use nonviolence. You are the weak. You must not be a coward. That is the worst, worst kind of things but you must use violence. And here you have Gandhi preaching violence to his son. I think that the image is perfect. It's a long story, but it's perfect for the Zapatistas. They lost everything except dignity. They were oppressed in the worst possible way. They tried everything, that amazing march of 3,000 people walking 2,000 miles. Nobody hurts, not the people, not the government. And then they tried as the last resource, the guerrilla. And then, but they learned the lessons when 12 days later, and the government was forced to declare a ceasefire, the Zapatistas adopted it immediately. And since then, since January 12, 1994, they have never again used their weapons, not even before attacks or paramilitary attacks. They have always found alternative ways to deal with every kind of conflict. 
that, that is a fantastic story uh, of the Zapatistas. The famous subcommandante Marcos uh, was saying a month later, well, we prepare ourselves for, uh, to fight for the guerrilla. Uh, we were not ready for a dialogue, but we will learn. <laughs> and they learned for the dialogue and they, they learned a lot of things, everything. What can you kind of give us uh, for those that are not familiar with the Zapatistas? Can you kind of give a um, just a brief overview of what they're doing and 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 promoting now? One one of the things that I I I will say immediately is that in my view, is the only human group well prepared for COVID nineteen. They, are, uh, they have the organization, the system, the way of life to live that life and to resist and to be organized. They have been doing very beautiful. They're living their own life. Um, you know, there are hundreds of communities in, in the Serva La Candona and uh, they produce their own food. They produce perhaps 95, 97% of what they eat. They have their own health system. They don't get a penny from the government. They have their own way. They have their own uh, way to, to live in a healthy, to have a healthy life. Uh, they have their own clinics. They have their own, their own way of life. If this, the government closes them completely, uh, they can continue living their life. Uh, beautiful, a healthy life, um, a very democratic life without hierarchies, uh, organized by themselves. They, 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 they have created an incredible human experiment. Um, and then they were really prepared. When they started to hear about the, the virus, uh, they closed the Zapatista area. They, that was red alert. They did not allow anyone to come inside the Zapatista area. Uh, and they organized themselves to deal with the virus in their own way. It is a very interesting combination of ancestral, ancestral medical wisdom uh, with contemporary resources uh, combined in a dialogue uh, for them to deal with the, with the problem. Uh, they are, of course, uh, suffering a lot of restrictions of different kinds, but they, are very, they were really very well prepared without confinement, without social distancing, distancing and taking precautions, of course, and trying to have a very, very, a very good attitude about the about the virus, but dealing with it in a very wise and human way. Yeah, and they had the um, advantage of being able to cl basically isolate themselves during COVID nineteen, where because they were able to grow their own food and be autonomous, they weren't dependent upon supply chains. So. That's why they were able to, you know, live um, live freely amongst but their own. Not the only case. You know, there are many thousands of communities in Oaxaca, indigenous communities. When they heard about the virus, they closed the community. They closed it completely. Just the community, not the whole area, not the region, but mm. the, the, the community itself. And that was that had an incredible impact, uh, Brian. This is this is fantastic. Uh, let's say one example: Talia de Castro is one uh, one specific community in um, the northern Sierra of, uh, of Oaxaca. And then they closed it. They closed it even for people for, with a family in the community that were coming from the U.S. or Mexico City. They did not allow them to come into the into the community they organized the quarantine outside the community for 40 days, not 14 days, 14, 40 days of quarantine for those coming from outside before entering the, the community. But this had a side effect that is fantastic. We have been fighting against Coca-Cola for a long time. Uh, we are the, the per capita, the champions in the per capita consumption of Coca-Cola. We had a president that was the president of Coca-Cola. This is a disease. Uh, Coca-Cola is killing more people every day in Mexico than the virus or even the virus. 
uh, it, it is really terrible. And you know, Coca-Cola is, uh, is an addiction. It's not something that you say today, I will abandon Coca-Cola, I will use something else. It's not possible. The people fight to get rid of this. When Talea de Castro closed the village, they closed it also for the trucks of Coca-Cola. And then the addicts were forced to find other way to survive without Coca-Cola. And that has been fantastic. They now are enjoying, three months later, they are enjoying the benefits of not drinking Coca-Cola. This wow. is not only the Zapatistas, it is the model of the Zapatistas, but it is the Zapatistas are the best in the organization, the general organization in a whole region. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, your path through development and then into uh, autonomous learning? Yeah, it is uh, two, two different stories. One was, I was, when I was in the government, I was organizing development, but of course I discovered that that development was not what the people wanted and that in fact the development was really producing a lot of damage to them. When we created an independent organization, at the beginning we said, oh, we will bring in our analytical capacity and we will look for development with them without the intermediation of the government. And then after listening to them for two years, we changed the name of the organization and we discovered what they wanted was autonomy, decentralism and gestion. And that was the lesson by the people themselves telling us, no, we don't want development and development is, is, is producing a lot of damage to us. That was a lesson with, with the people. The lesson about learning is a different kind of, of, of lesson. Um, when my first uh, daughter became of school age and I started to look around for a good school for her, public or private school, uh, an institution to which I can trust my adored daughter. Uh, and of course I could not find one, then I created one beautiful school, this was in the 60s, a beautiful school uh, with the Freinet and Waldorf and Montessori, the, be the best alternatives. It was a school in which the children were in the garden, they had their assemblies to take decisions. It was beautiful and when we added one year every year for my daughter to continue her studies. When she ended high school, uh, we closed the school, a very successful school, because by that time we knew very well that the problem was not the quality of the school, but the school itself. And then in the following years, for many, many years, uh, we tried different ways until we discovered that instead of education, we need to reclaim the verb learning. But the question was learning, not education. It was not trying to educate someone, but to recover the agency, recover the capacity to learn that we have as babies. And then that was then the last uh, 30 years. I have been in different ways of learning how to learn in freedom, how to learn what we want to learn, doing what we want to learn. Now, um... Is that, it, it, was that part of that journey was your, let, uh, what I'm getting at is, it was that part of that journey when you connected with Ivan Illich? Well, it was, uh, um, my connection with Illich was almost by accident. Um, in the early 70s, when he was at the peak of his fame, he was living at 60 kilometers from my place, but we did not read um, Ivan, Ivan, for us in the Marxist left, uh, he was a reactionary priest and not were reading him. And we were saying, yes, he's criticizing education and health in a capitalist society, but with socialists, we will have good education and good health for the people like we are already having in Cuba. That, that was the mentality, that was what was in our mind. Then we did not read Illich. Uh, when he was really famous with the schooling society in the 70s. But almost by accident through a friend, I met him in 1983 when I was literally lost, enjoying a lot my experience at the grassroots, but not understanding uh, what was happening there. Uh, I was studying economics, political science, etc. 
the more I studied, the less I understood what I was seeing, <laughs> experiencing at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. And then I met Ivan by accident, 1983. Uh, I, I was fascinated with what I heard. I started to read frantically all his books. We became, I started to collaborate with him and uh, we became friends till the end of his, of his life. I was really very, very close to him. And of course, I learned first what I can describe as the people's discourse. What Ivan wrote was really what he heard among the people. It's the discourse of the people, the words of the people. The main categories of Ivan, like conviviality or, or vernacular, was he heard them in Mexico with the people at the grassroots. And then I, I recognized myself in that discourse and I discovered the, the words. Every time I talk about advanced ideas in a community today, uh, I, we produce what we call the aha effect. The people say, aha, aha. They, they know that. They, they, they have intuitively have the same idea. They have, they have not been able to formulate them as brilliantly as Ivan. But the idea is, is there. The idea is in the people. Then that is how Ivan is clearly very liberating for all of us. Because he anticipated what is happening today, Ivan is now more pertinent than ever. Because Ivan could so, Ivan explained it once what is a prophet. A prophet, he said, is not a person with a crystal ball that can uh, see the future but it's a person that can see the deep trends in the society. And then because he sees in the present those trends, then he can anticipate a probable evolution of, of uh, behaviors and, and, and facts. And then he anticipated what is happening today and the, the big, big crisis that we are suffering in all, all the areas the climate uh, collapse, the socio-political collapse, all these terrible situations in which we are today, he anticipated. And he also anticipated how the people can react in that kind of conditions and what is how we can create a whole new world, a whole new world uh, in the Zapatista tradition. Um. If he were alive today, what do you think he would say about the time we're living in and what we what we should do to uh, survive? Uh, he will be able. He already observed how um, these policies of confinement and uh, social distances that today in the COVID are going to the extreme. He already anticipated that path. And he said that we need to do exactly the opposite, that we must not to transform every other person into an enemy. Um, this is a moment to intensify our interactions with others, to take precautions, of course, to do a lot of things, knowing the, the something about the virus, but not at the price of sacrificing our human condition. That is, that is what they are forcing us to do. I can tell you that this is uh, the, the horrible situation which we are today. It, it is uh, really the, the end um, uh, of, uh, of uh, our condition as, as humans. Ivan used it a lot of times, particularly in the last 20 years of his life, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan uh, uh, with, with Christ. Perhaps you remember the, that parable. Uh, Christ is asked, who is my neighbor? Who is the person close to me? And then he tells the story of the Good Samaritan that a guy is dying in the, in the road and then the rabbi crosses and then no, they, they, he does not care about, about that person and the other person cross the path and nobody cares of him. And then the Good Samaritan take care of this guy and bring him to his house and, uh, and cure him. Well, this is the example in Christ of the first person, the first time in which a person deals with someone else that does not belong to his clan 
until then all the people would take care of the people of your own clan, of your own group. This is the case in which you trespass the boundaries of your culture out of love. And then who is your neighbor? Who is the person close to you? The person you love. That is, that is the interculturality in, in Ivan. If that is how he expressed the importance of trespassing the cultural boundaries of the intercultural dialogue of caring for the other and the importance of love as the what I would say today as the central political category. And then what he will say in COVID-19, what we need to do is exactly the opposite of what we are forced to do. Because what we are forced to do is isolate yourselves in your place and take care of yourself and that's it. You must not care for the others. The people are resisting that all the time. We are seeing in the US, in Mexico, everywhere, that people are resisting this hypothesis of confinement and transforming the other person, every other person into an enemy because he can bring you the virus. And we are trying to do something else instead of what we are instructed to do. That is what Ivan would say. He will laugh at the instructions of confinement and social distancing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, can you talk about your, your friendship with him? Um, because uh, I think how um, you and I have connected it has, hasn't been informed by your friendship with him. Because, um, you know, I, when, when I was living in Oaxaca, you know, I would say often, how, how, I mean, Gustavo is so busy and, and he's doing so many things all the time and he has time to sit down with me and talk with me for hours. Um, I, I, I was honored by it. You know, I was, I was just really deeply grateful for it. Um, and, um, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of that, you know, when we talk about friendship, it came, Ivan Illich came up. Because he knew, yeah, of course, he, he says he acknowledged that he was recognized that his worst sin was polyphilia because he lived for his friends and with his friends. At the end of his life, he started to say, now I know who I am because I can see myself in the eyes of my friends. And he really knew how to be a friend. And, and I, I think he, this, this was when he said love and friendship are the fundamental political categories today in the technological society, he knew what we were saying and he practiced this. Um, uh, you know, and uh, I, I was, uh, he was coming to a state college in the University of Pennsylvania uh, every year for three months. He had a special arrangement in that, in that place. And then um, he was, coming every, every, uh, every year for three months and invited his friends to be with, with him in that place. And we were there and we had a whole program of, of uh, activities, of a kind of seminars, of meetings, etc. And then one morning he came with us and told us, please cancel everything, I am leaving. Uh, and I don't know when I will come back. Cancel all, all our arrangements. And then he left. Because a woman that was his friend uh, that in Switzerland called him and told him, Ivan, I am dying. And before I die, I would like to see you for the last time before my death. And then Ivan took a flight and flight the next morning to see this woman, his friend and stayed with her for 20 days until she died. That is to be a friend, Brian. Yeah. That is uh, really, because uh, there is an element of gratitude with a friend in which you, 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 you can give to a friend whatever he or she needs with love, with joy, because it is your friend. And, and it is really joyful if you have something that your friend wants it is 
perfect to be able to give it to give this to your friend uh, because that is friendship uh, and then that that is that is Ivan uh, teaching how to be friends by being friends <laughs> by behaving like a friend knowing how to be a friend one very important point is that Ivan uh, was always talking with a person in front of, of him, not trying to teach him anything, but trying to have a good conversation. That is something that we learned with him and that you and me have had many, many times. We, we are really together. We are, we are not trying to sell anything to the other. We, we don't have any ultra, ulterior purpose, etc. We are talking as friends. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I've always felt that, you know, um, I, I've just been immensely grateful for our friendship because, uh, you know, every time that, you know, I, I needed to talk with you, you've always been there and been present. And uh, it's, it's, you know, in many ways, it's helped me survive through some difficult, isolating times. And uh, I'm, I'm immensely grateful for that. Um, and I'm, you know, I, it, it also shows the intergenerational, um, you know, effect of, you know, how friendship can be transferred and grow and become stronger. And it's, uh, you know, by your experience, you know, just as an example, by your experience with Yvonne and how that um, affected you. And also, you know, it, it's, it's transforming how I view friendship as well. Just our friendship has, is kind of informing how I'm friends with others and how, you know, um, like you said, the, what Yvonne said of um, when I see myself through the eyes of my friends and I know who I really am. Um, yeah. I think about that a lot. Um, and I think it's because of, you know, I think you, uh, there has been so many times in my life where I, you know, I felt, um, you know, going through this loss of losing my eyesight and hearing and, um, and everything. I, 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 you know, I come from a very able-bodied culture and disability is seen uh, as a, a problem rather as just a fact of life. And that, um, you know, pe people with disabilities are marginalized and that kind of able-bodied thinking has, informed how, um, you know, I've uh, kind of dealt with my own disability and loss and, and, you know, denying it and, you know, and so on. And, 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 um, you know, it's uh, through our friendship, you know, it's, it, you know, you, I, I, you know, there are many times I, I just, I was so depressed and so lost and, and, you know, you would encourage me to write and to, you know, um, take action. And I, and I, I'm deeply grateful for that because, you know, if, if we hadn't been having those dialogues, you know, I, I don't know where I'd be or what, what I'd be doing because, you know, you, you saw me, uh, Goethe has a quote and I, I can't remember, but it's basically paraphrased this, you know, you, you see, uh, people as they are and as how they ought to be, you know, and they become that you know, and, um, and I know I just fucked up the quote, but, but, but that's the idea of it. You see people as they are and they become what they ought to be through it. And, um, and I think about that a lot. And I think that's what you did with me because I'd be like, ah, oh, I'm a sh shitty writer. I suck. I, you know, like I, everything I'm saying is, uh, has been said before and much better than, uh, you know, and I, I just had this constant, like, voice in my head saying, you know, you're horrible. And, and you would always be counteracting that with love and kindness and, and respect. And, and that's what friendship I think, you know, really is because that's what I feel like, you know, um, you live, you know, you walk your talk and, uh, and that's, what's important is that your your the things you say align up with what you do and your actions and, uh, but uh, as you know, we, I have also allies. So Rachel is a great ally because also can share with me my opinions about you. By the way, for those, for those listening, Rachel is my wife. So <laughs> She also loves him <laughs> and knows <laughs> who he is and acknowledge who, who he, he is. 
And um, one uh, beautiful thing, wonderful thing, uh, Brian, is that even if you can no longer see because your eyes are not no longer um, useful for seeing the world, still you will be able for the rest of your life of uh, seeing yourself in the eyes of your friends. Because it is not uh, just the pupil, it's not uh, the millions of points, but it is something else. The, the metaphor of Ivan is very, very effective. And uh, you, you know, you are seeing what I am seeing in you. And, and you can discover yourself in my eyes, how I am seeing you. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an exercise in trust that I, I have, uh, you know, as Rachel <laughs> would, would tell you, and I think uh, you you sense it as well as, you know, I, 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 I think many people have this issue, but I, I and I quite, I don't quite understand it completely. But, um, you know, I, I, I have issues trusting others. And um, you, through your love and kindness and friendship, you're have been able to help me trust others um and and that is you know i mean i think it's immensely important for building communities uh, you know and and resiliency is to begin with trust and uh, and move forward there and uh you know i always start with not trusting and being skeptical and <laughs> and uncertain and uh, i think you start from the opposite is that correct would you say Yes, yes, even Nicole is uh, still uh, criticizing me uh, because uh, trusting uh, too fast too many people. <laughs> and, uh, she said, but why you are trusting this person that you just met? Uh, you don't know if, 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 if he, she, he or she can be trusted. And uh, the question is that, um, yes, I have been betrayed. People have failed to this trust. But the best uh, way to know that is to trust the people and then suffering the consequences. I, I prefer to suffer the consequences of trusting someone that did not deserve that trust, that having all these fundamental distrust of the other person and, and then putting all kind of proofs and tests before trusting someone. And that is my problem. This is, I am not recommending this. It is not a recipe for anything. I'm not saying that you must do that, but it is the story of my life. Yes, and that people have betrayed me and I have, be, I have been putting my trust in people that did not deserve it. But I prefer uh, to trust and then discover later that that was wrong, that the other way. I think, you know, in, in, in listening, I, I feel like you're not afraid of the pain or the suffering that yeah. will yeah. happen from betrayal. You know, that's, I mean, I, that's one thing I'm thinking about. All I can think about is like the pain and the suffering that I'm going to go through by being betrayed or um, whatever could happen, uh, which is ultimately, in my imagination, the worst thing possible. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I think that's a, uh, you know, one of the things that that inspired this project and, and, you know, actually getting into my relationship with my wife was uh, there's a beautiful Lakota prayer. And one of the, the lines from it is, I will love beyond my fears. And, um, and I still, it's a beautiful statement. I will love beyond my fears. And uh -huh. that's what I've been trying to do you know, ever since I met my wife and, um, and in every aspect of my relationships. And that is a very beautiful way uh, to close today this conversation because we are at the end of our time. But uh, Brian, I don't know about you, but I, I would like very much to continue this conversation at another time. Yeah, let, let's do a part two. But, you know, one thing I would like to just kind of acknowledge, because I think listeners are going to, I know some listeners are going to be like, what was that about? And, and I'm talking about the COVID-19 stuff. And what, what I'd like to kind of clarify is, I think what, you know, because so many people like in the United States, and I feel like it's being used as a very divisive 
uh, tool to divide people and to, you know, create um, disunity is, um, you know, the mask. There's like, there's an, there's a definite anti-mask wearing movement. And, um, and it, you know, it, it, as far as we can tell, and that's the other thing is like, we just don't know enough yet to really understand it because like, you know, I even just heard recently, this is actually a, a, a personal story. A nurse uh, th that I, I heard uh, said that a doctor recently contracted COVID-19 through his eyes. So he had to start wearing, so doctors start, had to start wearing goggles because they contracted it that way. So like these, the information keeps changing. And, you know, I, and I think I just want to like reiterate because I think people listening are, are may misunderstand uh, what you're saying is, um, you know, in my mind, we, we need to take every precaution, wear a mask, and because we don't know everything yet. And, um, and uh, I think, um, you know, especially is trying to tell people to wear a mask because you're protecting others, you know, because there are people that have very uh, vulnerable immune systems, and um, they could be compromised if, uh, you know, so you know, I just, I just kind of like to clarify that I, I think, and, I, and you can correct me, but what you're saying is that we, we should not allow, you know, people to be forgotten or isolated because of COVID-19, that we should take every precaution to protect uh, uh, each other, but act in a way that is loving rather than seeing everyone as a, a potential vector for virus. Absolutely. You, you said this in a very beautiful way. Yes, when I am going outside, I have a magnificent place to be confined because I have a kind of paradise in, my, in the hills in San Pablo, Etla. This is a beautiful place to be confined. But I go outside and I go to Unitierra and I met with other people. And of course, I am for the mask and I wear it. It is, first of all, yes, to protect the other. If, if you are infected and you don't know because you don't have any symptom, you are spreading the infection uh, through your uh, mouth. Yes, that is to protect others. But also there is another very, very important reason, uh, uh, Brian, it is protecting also yourself. Because if you have this, you are not touching your mouth. You are not touching your nose you are not even touching your eyes. Because if you observe yourself, we have a natural propensity to touch our face all the time. Because you are doing this or because you are doing this, we touch our face all the time. And if you are around and the virus is around, touching your face is the way to get the contagion. Then the mask also helps you not to put your hands that can have the virus into your mouth and then get the virus for yourself. And then yes, you are protecting others and also protecting yourself. Yes, I am for taking precautions about something that we don't know enough, that we, we lack a lot of information about the virus, but that does not prevent us from talking with others, working with others, seeing others, trying to inter not only interact with others, but intensified our interaction with others. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I talk with people with dis disabilities and severe underlying health conditions, and, you know, they're, they're feeling extremely isolated, and they need, you know, um, food. And so, you know, there has to be, you know, uh, every precaution taken to you know, get them, uh, you know, and I'm part of the community of people with disabilities get uh, their needs met somehow and with the, every precaution taken. But in any case, thank you for clarifying that. And um, the other thing, I, could you please tell everybody that's listening and watching um, how they can learn more about you and uh, maybe list some of your, your uh, books that are available? Well, um, internet is the source, what to do. Uh, they can find my name in internet and they can find my, my books. And of course, uh, they can also write to me. It's very, very simple. It's my name, Gustavo Esteba, one word, 
uh, at uh, gmail.com and then can write to me i always answer my mail and uh, okay. they can use internet and see my name gustavo esteva in the in the look for my page i did not write my page but someone wrote it good in wikipedia and there are lots of references videos etc in internet well thank you it, it it has been an honor and let's definitely continue the conversation in uh, part two and um thank you thank you so much for being here with us and Thank you, everybody, for listening to the first episode and watching the first episode of The Blind Man in Black. We will be back soon. And uh, if you'd like to uh, check out our website or my website, I, <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's just myself right now. But anyway, um, just go to the uh, blindmaninblack.com at blindmaninblack.com. And uh, thank you once again, Gustavo. It is an honor and a pleasure to have you. And let's continue the conversation. Thank you, Brian. See you soon. Abrazos. Abrazos. Okay, I gotta, I'm not sure what happened here. I'm, this is gonna be awkward again. Okay, here we go. You are still recording?